This is the House of Hockey podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. Hockey is more than a game, it's a lifestyle. It's you, the diehard supportive fans, your favorite players who are on the team you cheer for and the organization who supports them. The companies that make your gear, bags, and beer league sweaters, the hockey moms and hockey dads, and everything else that makes this House of Hockey your home. Come on in, I'm Breezy. And I'm Ray Ray. And And this this is is our house. house. Pigskin fans, the moment you have been waiting for all season is right around the corner. And DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55, is bringing back their golden ticket giveaway with up to $55 million in prizes up for grabs. All you have to do to get your share of these huge prizes is enter DraftKings' free Super Bowl prediction challenge. Once you submit your picks, you will get a free instant prize up to $25,000. And if you have the most predictions correct, you could win the top prize of $1 million. Download the app now, enter the free prediction challenge, answer questions like who will score last, and boom, get ready to make it rain. DraftKings has paid out over $7 billion, that's with a B, to its players since 2012, so they know a thing or two about big paydays. So here's what you have to do. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code THPN, that's for the Hockey Podcast Network, to enter the free $55 million Super Bowl prediction challenge. Everyone gets an instant prize up to $25,000 just for playing. So use promo code THPN now and enter the free $55 million Super Bowl challenge only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55. Terms, conditions, and eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Well, here we are, episode 46, and we got a sponsor for DraftKings. Yes. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do that. A free chance to win money. Yeah, I'm going to do that, too. I was like, all I have to do is download the app and then enter in THPN, and then I could win. I could win. Why not? Makes it more fun to watch the Super Bowl, too. And, hey, I haven't probably will have better luck with that than winning the lotto because I've spent so much money on lotto tickets the last two weeks I'm like what am I even doing you know I actually I did research win the lotto you gotta buy a lotto ticket it's true and I did research I had a spreadsheet going on like the probabilities of and I'm not good with numbers or math of like numbers being selected Mm -hmm. I didn't even have a single number on my lotto ticket a single number I think you might have better luck with DraftKings. I think so. So I'm going to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, welcome to episode 46, everybody. I'm Ray Ray. And I'm Breezy. And this week we have a dynamite guest. Ray Ray. Yes, we do. Rick Nifty Middleton. He is an NHL legend. Uh, He played 14 seasons in the NHL. Uh, 12 of his seasons were with the Boston Bruins. They even retired his jersey number. Um, Which we talk about in the episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number 16. uh, No one in the in the bees can wear that. He uh, he also is president of the Bruins Alumni Association. So he talks all about that. And then uh, of course his days playing great stories and then something you guys might find really interesting is that he coached the 2002 u.s men's sled hockey team to win its to win gold for the first time ever they were like an underdog losing team and um after his career playing in the nhl nifty uh tells the story of how he got that job and how they won gold and how they're making a movie about it coming to the silver screen for you and you may just see a little cameo of our girl ray ray i basically begged nifty to let me be a reporter in the movie (laughs) 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 because Uh, that's so cool come on that is cool that is cool so stay tuned for that you're really gonna love it nifty's uh 
so like charismatic and uh, has so many great things to say. He's so well-spoken and uh, offers a lot of great opinions about the game and his time playing. It's kind of like hanging out with someone you have a lot of respect for and you just want to listen to all the stories you could hear. And that's kind of how, how we were. We were just kind of hanging back and relaxing and listening to all these, uh, the good things that he was saying about the sport and his time and about players. So yeah, it was fun. Good yeah. times. You'll enjoy it. Yep. So we've had what, seven games of hockey as of when we're recording this? Six? I think so. Five or six games. and Depends uh, on what team you're following. Right. With COVID and, and all of that. But yeah, uh, full disclosure, I've only been able to watch highlights of the Blackhawks because I have had a crazy week uh, of work and things going on that I have not had time to sit down and watch. So I've been watching the eight minute highlight recaps, which are really low lights for the Blackhawks, uh, except for we finally got a win. <laughs> Um, on Friday, which Ugh. was, I think just helps with morale, but I think yeah. overall my thought is this really is what a rebuild looks like for the Blackhawks. Like this, uh, it's just, it's a rebuild. It's a rebuild. It's a season. struggle bus. Yeah. It's going to be a struggle bus up and down, up and down. And I, and I am just keeping realistic on that and I'm not getting yeah. my hopes up that this that they could be contenders because they're not going to be contenders. Well, I don't know what that was, but that's, I don't, I, I don't know either, but it looked cool. It's like Rocky. Like he could have been a contender or is that from a different movie? I fuck that up all the time. Well, he could have been a contender. That's a quote from a movie. Yeah, I think so. I just, I'm not a big movie buff unless it's like horror movies. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I think teams are, are, uh, are struggling in general. Obviously the Blackhawks are having a hard time for multiple yeah. reasons. The Kings just got their first win the other day. Uh, they've been a complete struggle bus. Um, I'm just starting to talk about my teams now. Sorry. Go, but no, go. That's all the I had. Leafs, the Leafs have been doing pretty well. They're looking strong and the Nashville Predators got their butts handed to them by the Dallas Stars last night. And it was embarrassing. Uh, but they look, they've been looking pretty well, but we're just moving on from that. Um, <laughs> Breezy doesn't want to talk about it, guys. No, I don't want to talk about it. But in other oh, news. Especially, wait, because we have to clarify, this was the Stars' first game of the season because their season got delayed. So it was extra hurtful. Yeah, it, it wasn't good. The <laughs> only thing bad about that game was I was able to enjoy the new, and they're not a sponsor. I wish they would sponsor us. Maybe they can. Truly Iced Tea. It is Ooh. so freaking good. It's ridiculous. Like, and I'm not a Truly fan, but the Truly iced teas, so good. I went and bought two more packs today. That was that's the an, only thing that got me through. That's an alcoholic beverage? It an is. adult beverage? It's an adult beverage, 21 and older. Uh, do not drink uh, underage and drink responsibly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Not like we're driving yes. anywhere. So stay home and be no. safe, kids. <laughs> Exactly. But I highly recommend I will give you a full review. If you want to DM me, I can tell you uh, how I feel about them. Um, they're very good. Bud Light Lemonade is also very good. I tried both of those. That's my little hot take of this moment. Anyway, I like back it. to you. I like on it. Radio. Back to you, folks. Back to you, Ray. <laughs> First of all, I'm just like very happy that I have access to hockey. Um, and yes. in the moments that I do have time, to watch. I'm very happy that I get to watch it. Um, there's also just so much hockey happening again, like we had when the bubble playoffs was going mm -hmm. on. So it's a little overwhelming to me, but I'm not complaining. Let me make that very clear. Shut the front door. There's something about Austin Matthews fashion and physical style choices with the mustache and the hairdo that makes me want to punch him in the face. I feel like if he were to wear like <laughs> black on black or like a pinstripe black, I feel like he would be a part of like the Adams family. <laughs> oh my God. He looks like the, like the, the dad, the, the dad with the mustache. Yeah. He's just like, <laughs> yes, that's exactly. Adams family. I don't, I like, I can't put my finger on it. I don't know the guy. I, I 
could care less about the Leafs. Like it doesn't bother me in the least. I don't feel threatened, but like, I see him. It's like, he's trying too hard and he doesn't live up to his potential on the ice and something about like the outward, like dressing weird with like the bucket hats and then like the Louis Vuitton scarf and like, it's just he's very like, bro. European, very European. And he's not from Europe. He's from Arizona. He's from fucking Arizona. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm all for people like expressing themselves, but I, I think it's just something that doesn't align for me with like the cockiness off the ice and then the like the non not it matching on ice Mm -hmm. like something to me is like you don't get the right to be that way like you're not Dennis Rodman like Dennis Rodman owned his shit off the ice like off the court like where he (laughs) dressed wild and crazy and, and like expressed himself but he also like delivered when it counted so I think that's why I kind of like bubbles in me and I am just like, ugh. except I have to give Austin Matthews credit where credit is due. The only good thing I've ever seen from that guy on social media that made me very happy, but also very mad at the same time was that he alerted me to the fact that one of my favorite television shows, Peaky Blinders, is returning and they're gonna make a movie about it and i was like yes and then i was like who told me this austin matthews damn it now i can't damn it why did this really good news have to come from him maybe i like him a little bit now um if you don't know peaky blinders you're missing out netflix baby fantastic television fantastic Uh, television and yeah so that's my shut the front door on austin matthews Hmm. You know, I, we were just talking about Austin and, and becoming, having like a character aspect to him. Yeah. And I, and it clicked to me. I think I know why I like Matthew Kachuk. Why? Because he kind of reminds me of Morgan Wallen and I love Morgan Wallen. Who's Morgan you know, Wallen? I don't know if we can be friends anymore. This might be our last episode. No, I don't, <laughs> I'm Googling. A singer? Yes. Oh, I, I, what's the song he sings that I would know? What song does he not sing that you should know? Oh, God. I'm giving you a lesson after this episode. Okay. Anywho. He's a country singer, everybody. He's a country singer. He's got the mullet. He's just... He does. He's just that kind of guy. He reminds me... Matthew Kachuk kind of reminds me of, of Morgan, and I think that's why... We're just going to move on from this, because now I'm just... <laughs> I just I'm dragging I'm dragging I'm sorry I'm sorry it's fine it's fine it's fine that's okay um I I forgive you it's okay I I will know everything about him when we're done shortly put on all his music and put it on repeat to make up he just he released a double album there's like 20 songs and they are so good breezy's a barbecue kit I am doing a cherry smoked pork butt yeah so i'm gonna do some it's basically a cherry rub and it's been smoking it'll be smoking for 10 hours um that's gonna be good pulled pork sandwiches a pork butt is not really a butt it's a shoulder everyone don't freak out i don't know why it's called pork but we've i think we've had this conversation before but uh yeah that's what i'm doing This week's episode of the House of Hockey podcast is brought to you by... Looking to spice up your sex drive and your love life? Try Libido Drops for women. It's formulated to enrich your sexual response, arousal, and lubrication. Libido Drops are healthy and organic. Just add a few drops to water each day. Try Libido Drops with no risk, complete satisfaction guarantee, or your money back. Order your bottle of Libido Drops for women now at libidodrops.com. And we have a promo code for all of you House of Hockey podcast listeners. You will get 10% off your first order when you visit libidodrops.com. In the checkout, in the coupon code, enter HOCKEY10. 
That's hockey 10 for 10% off your first order of libido drops. Go to libidodrops.com. Our podcast is proud to be on the Hockey Podcast Network, and the network is home to many other incredible podcasts, including this one. Calling all Jets fans and foodies. What's going on, guys? I'm Brandon Rewicki, the host of Skates and Plates on the Hockey Podcast Network. Look, if you love Jets hockey, this is the place for you. In-depth breakdowns from every game, a deep dive into the big plays and moments from Winnipeg's season, and all the Jets talk you will not find anywhere else. We got it for you on Skates and Plates. Plus, if you love carbs and everything tasty, we jump into the world of food as well. Once a week, we also speak with a member of the local culinary scene to highlight their great stories and the great food they put out. So there it is. Hockey, Jets, food, drink, everything good in life. It's right here on Skates and Plates on the Hockey Podcast Network. Please give a big welcome to NHL legend Rick Nifty Middleton, who has played 14, who played 14 seasons in the league, earning 988 points in 1,005 games. He spent the last 12 seasons with the Boston Bruins. He scored 45 goals and 100 points in 114 playoff games. 114 playoff games. That's crazy. And number 16 is now retired in Boston. Nifty is currently the president of the Bruins Alumni Association. And he coached the 2002 U.S. men's sled hockey team to win gold, gold medal, baby. Uh, And he's actually developing a movie based on that experience and his real life story. I hope you really enjoy our conversation with Nifty. Two Mm. years with the Rangers, or two seasons rather, and 12 seasons with the Bruins. You had a hat trick in your first Bruins game. (laughs) Tell us... (laughs) about your time playing. I mean, like I could rattle off all of your accomplishments well, and goals and moments, but I'll go back a little, I'll go back a little bit. Uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada. Right. I grew up in the sixties, basically uh, when the Maple Leafs won four Stanley cups. And, you know, in those days you had three channels on TV. There wasn't anything else to do, but go out and play hockey, especially if you're a young Canadian boy. And I was, uh, my dad had bought a, uh, a house in a new suburb of Toronto. So we had a bunch of new kids on the, on the block, not, not the band, but a lot of, uh, <laughs> everybody seemed to be the same age. We had tons of, of players and I was the organizer. I had the street light out in front of my house and I played street hockey. Every, every time I, day I wasn't on the ice, I was, I was there. They throws a, a rink in the backyard for me when I was four years old. Wow. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't like, Oh, my son's going to play in the NHL. Actually, I was playing baseball when I was like six years old, five or six, uh, softball. And my baseball coach was a hockey coach, and he talked my dad into bringing me out. Or I may never have even played hockey. So funny how things happen. Uh, Just grew up, you know, year after year in Toronto. And then at the age of 13, I switched organizations. I got the coach that was a power skating nut. And he told me to do ankle exercises at night, strengthen my tendons and my ankles because uh, I wasn't a very strong skater. And in three years, changed my life. And by the time I was 16, I got six full scholarship offers. One was to BU, Michigan Tech, Michigan U. And I uh, got drafted by the Oshawa Generals in the OHA, um, being hockey uh, women, you know, the Ontario Leagues. And uh, Oshawa was only half an hour from my house in Toronto. So I ended up staying at home. I didn't play my first year I got drafted because I didn't feel I was big enough or strong enough. And I played a year of junior B in Toronto. And then I played two years of A. And my last year was my draft year. In those days, you had to be 20 to be drafted. I didn't even start playing junior until I was 18. I see these guys playing in the NHL at 18. I'm I'm just amazed how good they are. But my draft year was my best year ever. You know, if you're going to have a good year, you want to have it in your draft year. And, uh, I led the league in goals uh, with 67 that year and a oh, third in points, believe it or not. <laughs> and wow. uh, the Rangers took me in the first round. It was a dream come true. And the draft in Montreal, my parents went up there. They weren't televised in that, those days. It was 1973. Wow. 
And if you uh, remember, well, you're too young to remember, but you probably know this, the Bruins and the Rangers played for the Cup in 72, and the, and the Bruins beat them out in six, and I got drafted by the Rangers the very next year. So they still had a Stanley Cup caliber team, so I couldn't crack the lineup, and they sent me to their farm team, which was Providence, Rhode Island. So I was in New England when I was 19 years old, playing, living in Cranston, Rhode Island, playing for the Providence Reds. And the first year they built what they call the Dunkin' Donuts Center now, it's still there. And uh, it, was aw- it was awesome. My first time really away from home and uh, got, got used to it very quickly. <laughs> Ten single guys in an apartment building, you know. I still have great memories of that year. And this year I made it up to New York, like two years in New York. First year I had 18 goals by Christmas and then I got a stick in the mouth, lost four teeth and uh, 16 stitches. And I couldn't eat very well. They took me on the road and we had a game in uh, St. Louis, uh, Chicago, and then into Minnesota a week later. And a guy came to hit me. I went to miss the check. I went over on my own left ankle and I fractured my ankle a week later. So. Oh, my God. Oh, geez. I, the, I only ended up with 22 that year. I had 18 by trick. And that ruined the rookie of the year chances. And then the next year was the year of the big trade. Uh, they fired Emil Francis. They traded Derek Sanderson. They uh, traded uh, Brad Park and Jean Rattel for uh, Phil Esposito, Carol Banner, and three coaches that year. And it was the only year in my career I missed the playoffs. And I was probably having a little too much fun. I'll admit it. I was 20, 21 years old in New York. Just having, but when you're on a winning team, they don't really care. When you're not winning, you know, they look at everything. And uh, Espo came to the team, and, and it wasn't that he wanted – to get rid of me, he wanted one of his old wingers from what I've read in his books and stuff from Boston. So that's how it happened. We convinced John Ferguson, our third coach that year, to uh, to get one of his old wingers from Boston. And they showered on me, so they decided to make the trade, and they traded me to the Bruins. So, you know, wow. nobody wants to be traded, but when I started, and that was in May, so I had the whole summer to really think about it. And, uh, you know, more I thought about it, I'm thinking, geez, they didn't make the playoffs in New York. And now I'm going to be playing with Brad Park. Bobby Orr at the time was still on the team, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, this might be fun. And uh, unfortunately, by the time I got to Boston training camp in September, Bobby was gone. Uh, one of my biggest regrets. But I already knew Brad Park, Jean Rattel, and then uh, Peter McNabb had just got traded from Buffalo there. So him and I roomed together for eight years. And uh, we went to the finals my first two years in Boston. I went from not making the playoffs to the Stanley Cup finals two years in a row. Unfortunately, against Montreal, <laughs> who, you know, most of the players are in the Hall of Fame today. But, yeah. Well, uh, uh, a friend of the podcast and your friend, Brad Park, who you just mentioned, uh, I, of course, hit him up for any uh, good questions or insight to ask you about. Uh, uh, and- <laughs> And he said to ask you uh, about why you were really traded um, to Boston. I know you said because of Espo wanting a, a winger, uh, but is that just, is that the true story? Well, uh, yeah, well, it's a true story. Like I said, it wasn't like <laughs> is, one. Or is the, that the only reason? Well, it wasn't the only story, but it was. <laughs> okay, a, let's hear the I, other story. I read it Espo's book. It had to be true. But um, no, uh, what happened was that Derek and I played together my rookie year and there uh, a lot of the Rangers still hated his guts from the 72 cup series. Then he was cocky and brash. And, and, and so myself and the other rookie at the time, Ron Greshner, you know, we're, and Steve Vickers and a couple of young single guy, you know, really didn't care. And we would hang out with Derek, but then um, they traded him the next year. And there's always rumors about him and the party and everything. I'm not even going to go into that. Um, but the next year they traded him and then some reporter asked me, uh, or they put it in a paper that the reason they traded him, he was getting two of the younger players into training problems, Rick Middleton and Ron Gresham. That was like three weeks after he was already gone. So I'm like, that's not good. They're using him as a scapegoat. You know, the us as a scapegoat or the reason that, that they traded him. I didn't like having my name in the paper. You know? mm-hmm. So I said, uh, some reporter asked me a couple weeks later, I didn't say anything bad. Next day, New York Post, Middleton takes shot at Boss, inch high headlines in the New York Post. And that started the whole process of it. 
And uh, but I think what Brad's referring to is that my my lifestyle in New York, and, uh, as I just explained. Mm -hmm. um, no, we used to hang out at a little bar on First Avenue called the Tittle Tattle. <laughs> 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 and the Jets and the Giants would play Sunday afternoon, and we'd play Sunday nights, and the place would just be jazz, just be jazz. But it was it was a lot of fun. Hey, got me to Boston. Got me to Boston. So, what was New York like then? Was it well, just you know, as amazing and incredible as we like picture it? Well, yeah. I mean, I still get goosebumps going to Madison Square Garden. You know, it's the only rink that's left that I played in. Once they build a new rink in Calgary, the Saddle Dome. And, the, and Madison Square are the only two rinks, and they're building a new rink in Calgary. So. But I still get the goosebumps going in there. I have some great memories of those days. Uh, only two years, but New York was New York. You know, it was my first. It was, I was a rookie. It was so many impressionable. They kept us out in Long Beach, Long Island, because we could never practice in Madison Square Garden. So that was our alternate practice one. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's a young 20, 21 year old to do? You know, the bars are open before. And uh, you know, I, I didn't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, do you have? Ago. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any fun, uh, like rookie party stories or anything that you can share with us? Any rookie, uh, rookie pranks, party. maybe? <laughs> well, in those days, they used to initiate you. And like I was warned that don't let them get you at night when they've had a. Oh. Few. So luckily they didn't, but they got me in Oakland, California. They were there playing the California Golden Seals. Mm -hmm. And after practice one day, they grabbed me. And uh, as I was heading to the shower, and, and they put a wet towel over my face. And I won't tell you what they did with a hockey lace. And, oh. and uh, in the end of a hockey stick. I'm just going to leave it at that. Oh, but, no. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, on, I had to I had to wear gauze pads for a while because I was cut so bad. Yeah. Oh my but goodness! Now, now they wouldn't. But you know, you look at it as being accepted to a team. That's the way I looked at it. You know, it, it wasn't like they didn't like me. It was like, it was, okay, you're one of us now. And, uh, it was sort of have? like a respected and and yeah. A, in those days, it was. A lot of times they shaved your head. So <laughs> back in the days when you didn't wear helmets, you could always tell the rookies out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were i had hair down to my shoulders in those days and and they were nice enough not to shave my head so. oh yeah don't want to ruin the flow man <laughs> yeah exactly especially when you're like out and about in new york you know like to have a 70s. shaved head that was not the style then <laughs> no 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 it was the 70s it was long hair and, uh, Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. I think the rookie parties have, have come a long way from, from that. But I think that well, that's is what I hear. They, they get, they go, they all go out and drink all this expensive wine and they make the rookies pay for them. But, uh, exactly. Most of them can afford it these days. Yeah. Right. I think it's a really interesting way to show, like you can really see the difference in the style of play from when you played just based on your description of like your rookie initiation to like how it is today. And it's just so different. Like, what do you think are the, the biggest differences aside from like the speed and the youth? Well, the goalies uh, to me, I mean, the goalie equipment, the style, the butterfly mm -hmm. and the size. I mean, I was just watching the Bruins and uh, New Jersey and New Jersey's goalie Blackwood is six foot four, two twenty five. Oh, he bends down. He, he bends down. His back is touching the crossbar. Wow! But I said I couldn't play today because there's no five hole. <laughs> <laughs> How many five hole goals did you score, Nifty? Oh, oh, quite a few. Uh, the joke was the puck never hit the back of the net. <laughs> <laughs> just like dunk it through, just you know, steer it through, and the thing would wobble in over the line. You know. I love it. Oh, so good. Did you have a like a go-to move to try to you know change it up a little bit? So well, I always, no. I always joke I only had one move, and, but <laughs> I tried it so often that it had to work. You know, percentage of the time. But, right. And it, it was really, um, you know, uh, going down the right. I was a right wing and a left winger, but primarily on the right wing. What I like to do, and in those days, you could change your speed. I mean, Mario Lemieux was classic at it. He always, 
people thought he was lazy, but he would he would go slow on purpose because he always had about four gears. And me, I like Barry, Pe especially in the 80s when Barry Peterson was my centerman, he knew exactly when I wanted to get it, right around the red line. So I'd have a chance to have my, get my head up. And if I had enough of a gap, it was the, the word they use today, the gap, if the defense was back a little too far, then I would try to slow it down a little. So then the defense would have to slow down. And by the time I got to him, he'd almost be flat footed. And I always like to throw it in between their feet and their stick, not not through their legs, because they're trained. Defense are trained to look at you. They're, look, they're trained to look at your chest and not take their eyes off you. But when you put it in the, between the feet and the stick, their peripheral vision, they can still see it. And it's very hard when you see that part not to look down. <laughs> and as yeah. soon as you look down, they're gone. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was kind of the thing that I, I, I mastered over time. And, and they, very often I get knocked on my butt because they wouldn't look down and I'd be given it the, the head fakes and you know nothing would work. And then boom, they, they knock it out. But <laughs> you know, when you make them look silly, then it's hazardous to your health. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> then they want to come after you the rest of the game. So that was kind of my way of intimidating guys to get them really mad at me. So they take stupid penalties. Nice. Yeah. Now, very smart. What about your time with the Bruins? So 12 seasons, which first of all, that's mm. incredible. Like that's just amazing. And to play in good health, I assume, right? Well, 12 seasons with one team, you yeah. know, you hardly see that anymore. And I was, I was lucky to stay healthy. I was lucky to be on good teams. I was lucky to be on tough teams because it gave me a lot more room out there. Uh, the other teams had to worry about other guys a lot more than they worried about me. But, um, and, and playing on good teams, it always makes it a lot more fun. As I said, the only team, losing team that I was on, we didn't always have great years in Boston, but we made the playoffs all 12 years. Almost everybody made the playoffs in those days. Anyway. But, um, and a great bunch of guys. And, you know, some guys were there almost my whole career. Other guys would come in and leave. I look at it as two distinct eras. It was the end of the 70s, which I call the end of old time hockey, mm -hmm. because the helmet rule came in in 79. And that basically changed the game. It did eventually. So I kind of caught the end of old time hockey with guys that I grew up watching, like Roger Bear, Eddie Giacomo, and Pete Stumkowski in New York. I'm only 19, 20 years old when I'm playing with these guys, and they were my idols in Brad Park, you know. And then I get to Boston, and, and I'm a little older now and, and such. And then um, through the 70s with the Don Cherry era, you know, was too, going to the finals and then the semifinals with too many men on the ice. I scored with four minutes to go to put us up. We ended up with too many men on the ice with two minutes to go. Gila Fleur tied it with a minute to go, and they beat, beat us in overtime. And then they played the New York Rangers and beat them for the cup. And I would have, I would, that would have been awesome to play my old team in the Oh, yeah. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Okay. And then time was gone, and, and, and it was a different era. It was the, the 1980s now. And, uh, there, and not the first year, but Jerry Cheevers, the old goalie for the Bruins, came in as coach, and he actually stayed five years, and I was his go-to guy. So he gave me all the ice time in the world, power play, penalty play, first minute, last minute, and that's the only re and put me with Barry Peterson and Mike Kuzelinski on the line. And uh, we put up terrific numbers. And that's uh, really why they raised my jersey, because I was lucky enough to, to, to play with such great players and be able to put these numbers up. That's incredible. How, I mean, describe how it felt for you to, to raise your jersey and you know, uh, have such a big impact in, uh, in hockey. Oh, uh, you know, I always say, and, and it's, it's, I, this is my belief that I think it's the greatest honor an athlete can get, no matter what sport it is. But not everybody plays on one uh, team their whole career. And I didn't. I was two years in New York. I, I was 12 in Boston. And to be recognized by the team you play most of your career with uh, was unbelievable. And, you know, I, I honestly never thought of it until all of a sudden nobody was wearing it for a while. You know, you think, well, they didn't. They put it away for what year? You know, somebody will have it on next year after Mark film, I think, back in 2010, then 11, then 12, then 13. Nobody will learn it. I'm like, wow, maybe there's a chance, but you know, I didn't think about it all the time. 
And it really took the, because there's no rhyme or reason for this. Terry O'Reilly retired in 1985. They didn't retire him until 2001. Mm. And I, I don't even know. I think it was they were building the building and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> God. Um, but there's no rhyme or reason to it. And then all of a sudden it was July, middle of the summer. Cam, I heard uh, my secretary told me Cam was trying to get hold of me. And he calls me on alumni business because I'm the president once in a while. And I never even thought about it. And small talk, how's your golf game? You know, how's the family? He goes, well, we've decided we're going to raise your number. I went, what? Did I hear you? What? And honestly, I got emotional. And I'm not usually an emotional guy like that. And uh, my wife came home five minutes later. I thought somebody died. She looked at my face. I'm like, no. I said, it's retiring number 16. So, and that was July. And, and the date was uh, late November. So I had like four months to work on my speech. You know, oh, wow. uh, and just you know all the congratulations i was out 30 years i mean right. so i had a lot of a lot of people to thank and I, I i had the opportunity unfortunately i've lost like six good friends one of them i played with gary doke over the years they were great friends while i played and everything all, and i found out all their kids were going to be at my race into my jersey my oh. retirement so I got an opportunity on the ice in my speech to thank all of them, recognize them all, and thank their kids for coming. When I when I knew them, they were just little pint size. <laughs> right. Growing up. And so and not often you get a chance to do that. And so I, I tried to take advantage of it and try not to forget anyone. But, you know, you, you know, a lot of people over 30 years. In the, yeah. In the what was it that made it such an emotional moment for you? Like, is there anything in particular that like came up that you, like just when looking was, back on the career or just, you know. Cam called me or when I was on the ice. Uh, with, Both. You know, when Cam Both. called me, it was just a shock and a surprise because I had thought of it, but I wasn't thinking about it at that moment. Right. So he did surprise me. And like I said, I was surprised myself how emotional I got. Mm -hmm. uh, I still get a little emotional thinking about it, you know. Yeah. But then, um, honestly, when I was on the ice, I was a little nervous in the hallway, but I had worked on my speech. Like I said, I had four months to work on it. I didn't, I decided I wasn't, well, I was going to read it. I wasn't going to try to memorize it and mm -hmm. screw it up. And I was under a time, we had a little walkthrough on the Monday, where the, the thing was on a Thursday. We were trying it. So they had a little walkthrough. So I knew exactly what I was supposed to do, where I was supposed to go. And all the guys, the Bruins were on the bench. And I walked by the bench. I said, don't shake hands with all of them. We don't have time. So I, but I, by the time I hit the end of the bench, it was the Bergeron and uh, Chara. So I, I shook hands with them. And I wanted to sh shake hands with everybody out there. I didn't want to rush right to the podium. <clears throat> so Don Cherry was there. My old coach, I told you about from Toronto, came down. He's in his 80s now. And uh, the awesome. four guys from, uh, that were up there, you know, Bork and Neely and, and, and Lucic and Terry O'Reilly were there to, to help raise the banner. And all my wow. family was there. And four guys from the sled hockey team were there also. So I wanted to get a picture with each one of them on the ice. So I took my time. I went to each group of people, except my family, because I, I knew I was going to get pictures with them later. And, uh, and then I went to the podium and... Uh, just kind of read my speech. And once I got into a, a, uh, a rhythm, it kind of went pretty easy. And it was kind of dark because the lights are on you. I could hear everybody in the stands. I couldn't really see them. So I just focused on not screwing up my speech. <laughs> and, uh, and it came off well. My best line, and because and I, I knew Don Cherry was going to come up and say a few words. And he's, you know, him and I always had a, an antagonistic relationship uh and so he's always giving me a shot and i'm always sarcastic with him so a week before it happened i thought of this line because i wanted to get him before he got me so i said to him i, I, I said um, you know they asked me if i wanted to have some of my old 70s teammates down here with me tonight but I, and as i said that i turned and i looked at don i said but i told him i didn't want to have too many men on the ice and <laughs> <laughs> it could have seen the look on his face. <laughs> and I said, okay, Don, you want to say a few words? <laughs> yeah, you could have seen the look on his face. Oh, my gosh. It was a line, yeah, it was a great line. That was so, good, Nifty. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> kind of ended his, his coaching career. It wasn't, it wasn't very nice. But it wouldn't have been me that was on the ice. You know, I could have been the one to blame. I was on the ice. But, uh, well, you mentioned Don Cherry. So tell me, what was like, what was the best quality for you having him as a coach? Like, what did you learn or what changed in your game? Don, um, Don was a player's coach mm -hmm. and he had to be you know, he, he, he wanted to win more than anything. And he loved tough guys. I wasn't a tough guy. But he saw something in me that he took the time, you know, to, I guess, as they say, get you outside your comfort zone. So in New York, he always joked that at the end of the year, my rookie, well, not my rookie year, but my first year, he had to introduce me to the goalie because I, I would only go one way, you know. And he played me my first game. I got a hat trick, you know, playing on the line with John Vitale and Johnny Ducent. And I got 20 on the whole year because he basically didn't bench me, but he, he didn't play me on a regular line. He played me right wing, left wing, which really helped me later on. And, uh, and then would play me in the playoffs and such. And so he broke me in almost like it was my rookie year, but it was my third year in the league. But uh, Boston had a, a, a great lineup and you just didn't walk into a job. And so I, I realized that, but it was very frustrating because, I honestly didn't know what he wanted. And I thought I was doing everything the right way. And, and uh, but so he kind of pounded it into my head. And then the next year I played more in, in 79 a lot. And then by the time, uh, as I said, we rolled into the 80s, I was, I was ready for prime time. Yeah. So he, he really helped teach me the, the, the NHL game, if I was to put it into one sentence. Yeah. That's all you can ask for from a coach, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I was fortunate. I, I've heard of, of, you know, guys, players, not only NHL, college or whatever, when they have bad coaching or, or coaches that have an agenda, they quit the game. You know, the game goes south. They don't play in because of personality conflicts or whatever. I was so lucky. I only had two coaches growing up and uh, they're both great guys and, and made me help me enjoy the game. I had good coaching in junior. I had good coaching in, 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 my, in my rookie year in Providence. Uh, New York, uh, good coaching, but I had like four different coaches in two years. So it was a little mismatch. But going to Don was, was Don actually had a game plan. Don, Don, he wanted his team, you know, he traded Phil Esposito. I mean, here's a guy that knew what he wanted, knew the type of players he wanted, and he wanted to build the team he wanted. And Harry Sinner went along with him. And I, I just deem myself fortunate that he wanted to trade for me. Would you say that having, you know, the, the good coaching and whatnot made you want to be a coach for sled hockey? Uh, it gave me the confidence that I could do it, even though, you know, I coached my kids. But, you know, I had never been a coach in, in any sort of uh, adult uh, everything on the line type of thing. And honestly... I went in totally naive to that because I didn't even know what sled hockey was. And when I when I got the call asking me if I'd be interested, I only heard that their coach had quit in the World Championships. They only ever won one game in the history. And would you be interested? And I thought I had to like answer right away, or, or they're going to go somewhere <laughs> else. So I said, yeah, but because all I heard was hockey and Paralympics, and I figured I'm almost fifty. I don't think they're going to be calling me for the Olympics anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. so, I figured, well, why not take the show? I hadn't done anything at that level in over a decade because I retired in 89 and uh, now it was 2001. So um, so I said, I thought I'd take a shot at it naively, you know, and uh, I learned so much, you know, from, from these guys and how dedicated they are and what great athletes they are. And, uh, they, you know, it's, a, it's not the Special Olympics. It's a full check. Uh, you know, Olympic sport, Paralympic sport at the top level, and they take it serious and they they, they try to hurt each other. It's just like NHL hockey. They go out there and they'll do anything to win. Honestly, yeah. And you took the team to win gold, and you're as what? As it turned out. As it turned yeah. out, your na <laughs> naivete paid off, and you brought the team to gold. <laughs> Well, this is what happened. Um, my first, they asked, I think it was a test. They asked me to go to a camp in Tampa. It wasn't the selection camp. It wasn't, I hadn't been named, but they wanted me, 
me to go and, and I think they wanted to see if I knew what I was doing. So I don't know why it wasn't to this day. I don't know why Tampa, but uh, so I get on the ice for the very first time with these guys and I'm warming them up like normal. You know, you blow the whistle, you speed up and blow the whistle, go the other way. And then I blow the whistle and I yell backwards. And they all stopped and looked at me. I'm like, oh no, we don't go backwards. <laughs> oh, so right. we actually got a good laugh out of it, but they did, then they understood that he maybe he doesn't know that much about sled hockey. But obviously, I knew about hockey, and that's why they wanted to hire me. Um, and then after that, it was the, the selection camp was in August of '01 in Buffalo. Thirty guys from around the country showed up. We had to pick fifteen, and we were supposed to go to a tournament in in Montreal on September 13th, and September 11th happened. And we never played. They, Japan came over. They sent them home, and we never uh, went to, went there. Obviously, and I, I called a, a, an emergency camp two to three weeks after 9/11. And you guys were too young to remember, but nobody wanted to get on a plane. Yeah, no. And but we didn't have another camp scheduled. Our first camp until the end of October. I said, you know, we've only got six months to do this, and one weekend a month. That's all I have for, to to take this really bad team and try to not be embarrassed on our home ice in Salt Lake City. So we call an emergency camp, not knowing how many guys would fly in. I just, you know, from all over the country, Dallas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, and every guy showed up. Wow. Every guy showed up. I mean, planes were empty. Airports were empty. And every guy showed up. So that was kind of the aha moment that these guys are ready. And we never played another team. We only had camps amongst ourselves in the cities where the guys played. And what? never so we went in not knowing how we would do, and but nobody had seen us either. So nobody was ready for us because we were the last seed, the sixth seed out of six teams. So nobody gave us a thought because they were so bad in the world championships in Nagano in 98. So and, and then we ended up running the table and we outscored the opposition 22 to 3. Beat the number one seed Canada 5-1 in front of 6,000 people. Amazing. They never won another game and uh, ended up playing Norway, the, the gold medal champs from Nagano. And we had a, you know, I was shot 12-1 in the first period. We were only up 2-1, but up 3-1 early in the second, and then we got tired. And they, they made it 3-2. They tied at 3-3 in the third. Went to a 10-minute overtime. We're still tied 3-3. Went to a five-man shootout and went down to the last shooter. They scored on their first two shooters. Uh, goalie came. In those days, the goalies had to come over to the bench after everybody shoot. They get the shooter go out, the goalie go out. The goalie comes off, the other goal. It was like Chinese water torture, right? <laughs> well, after they scored on their first two shots, the, our goalie, Manny Garrett, comes over. So I looked down at him, and I, I didn't know how to motivate him. So I said, uh, you think you're going to stop one? <laughs> he looks up, and he goes, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I said, well, now be a good time. <laughs> we the next three, and we scored on the next three, and we won three two, and we won the gold medal. So you can wow. see it on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah, yeah, you see it on YouTube. Okay, but so you see our movie when it comes out. Exactly. So yeah. we want to get to the movie. Um, okay. You're in the process of making a movie called Tough Sledding that tells this whole entire story of what you just told us. Um, so let me ask you about that in a second. Sure. Describe the difference between winning gold with the USA sled hockey team and having that like ultimate moment compared to having your, your number retired from playing. <laughs> Or is that not even comparable? Not that yet. Nobody's asked me that yet. It's, uh, I have to say, you know, having your number retired, that, that's kind of a finale. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it was, it was kind of a way to put a bow on the end of a, a hockey career. People usually ask me, you know, what, what was your best moment in hockey? What was your most memorable moment? Thinking, you know, Stanley Cup, I was in three. I was in two Canada Cups. We, we won the Canada Cup in 84. I played on a line with Gretzky, you know, you know, but then I said, no, I said 2002 winning the gold medal was in hockey, my biggest moment. I never won the Stanley Cup. And it's different because I was a player my whole life. And now I was a coach. So when you're a player, you're only in charge of yourself and you have your job and you try to do it. 
be in the right place and uh, the ice, try not to, you know, have too many men on the ice, get on, get off, you know, you know all of, uh, I did my whole life. But now I'm in charge of hockey players. And I wasn't really that nervous about it until we got to the gold medal game. And then I realized, you know, I hope I don't screw anything up for them. You know, all I have to do is make a mistake that costs them the gold medal. I never, never forgive myself. So I actually got a little nervous about that. But yeah. that was, a, that was a, an incredible moment because of, you know, the, the old underdog thing coming in from six seed. Honestly, never thinking gold medal. What we talked about was if we were going to medal, we had to beat Japan and Estonia and probably Sweden. But number one, Canada, number two, Norway, we thought, you know, probably not. So let's take a shot. Let's see if we can get a shot at the bronze medal. Never thinking that we'd run the table and get to the gold game and win the gold medal. No, that's why it was, it was such a, a great thing. That's incredible. Well, I think we should uh, get to your movie. Can you... Uh take us through you know kind of what it's all about and well it, it's funny you know we, we do a lot of these zoom calls and everything and uh and uh, my but my assistant coach is a good friend of mine from my old, from my hometown tommy moulton uh, and he's part of the the group and another gentleman by the name of gary brandt and uh, as the story goes uh, as president of the bruins alumni his son was going to mit they lost their charter for their hockey team Make a long story short, we played them in an in a, in alumni game three years in a row. They raised enough money, and now they're, they're, they're hockey is solvent. So Gary and I stayed on as business uh, you know, partners, which we still are today. But I didn't tell him the story. He's from Canada. He's from Toronto, grew up in Montreal, and, and he's a hockey guy. And I didn't, he went to Queen's uh, University, and I didn't tell him the story like right away because I've told it so many times. I was just over lunch. He goes, you're kidding me. I never heard this story. He said, this has got to be a movie. I know some guys in LA. I'm, I'll give them a call. So that's how it happened. They wrote a script and Gary being a businessman, he says, Hey, I, you know, I put it in a plan ahead of us. You know, I, I thought nine months, we'd pound out a movie and it would all be good. <laughs> Four years <laughs> later, we're still trying. And we've learned a lot about the industry, um, but we actually had a call with a gentleman from Tribeca Films uh, Friday because Tommy, my assistant coach's wife, is a De Niro. So, but he didn't want to use the family connection until we were ready and we knew what we were doing. So mm -hmm. we finally got in to, to talk to them. We also we also have a, um, a, a, a production crew from Massachusetts. That do basically indie films. We, you know, we thought we we wanted to get this done for the 22 Winter Olympics, so mm -hmm. we thought we were in a hurry. But we kind of run out of time now, and uh, so we have them uh, as a film crew. So we're not really sure where we're going or how big this would go because if you just to use a name, say a Wahlberg, because he's a Boston guy, if he should be interested or try that, you know, Wahlberg, it's a lot of money for a film that just raises the money. So we are, we, we're going to take our time, we're going to make this right, and we're going to try to make it as big as possible. And we're not sure we can, but I think the story is good enough and rich enough, and the characters are, that we're going to have, we're aiming to have the most disabled actors in any movie in history, in our movie, because all the players will be played by disabled actors, not able-bodied able actors playing disability. And then we're going to use the, the, because you can't teach anybody to play sled hockey in a week. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to uh, try to use the national team guys for all the, all the ice scenes. Nice. And then the doubles off the ice. Unlike Miracle, and I didn't know this, I always thought Miracle, the guys that played Ruzioni and Craig and those guys, I thought they were hockey, I mean, uh, actors that could play hockey. But they were actually hockey players they taught to act. That's it's just important. like slap shot. A lot it's of slap shot uh, is that way too, right? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> slap shot, but they had to teach Paul Newman how to skate. Well, that yeah. The skating lessons I heard. Yeah, and I'm dying to find out why he wanted to make it so bad because he couldn't even skate. How did he <laughs> know it was a, a cult movie? Uh, I I played junior hockey with one of the guys in that movie, the big blonde kid that always has the girls under his arm. <laughs> 
Didn't, his name's Guido Tanisi. If you no. look in the his name's oh, Guido. Oh no. <laughs> they never gave him a line in the whole movie. And he's in the movie a lot. But he didn't say boo. He didn't have one line. <laughs> Was he like that in real life? Uh, he's kind of a quiet guy, big quiet guy, but they could have given him a line because he was in a lot of scenes, you know, with the yeah. girl. No, I uh, mean like the ladies' he... man. Was he like a ladies' man? Oh, oh, no, no, not that I remember. We only played two years of junior together. That's so funny. Yeah. Well, I'm excited yeah. for you. I think everything that, you know, I've talked to you before we got on the podcast and, and yeah. I, I know a lot about the film and your story and I'm really excited for you because I think it's a really great um, story that just needs to be told. So we're well, people can check it, check it out and see it. It's, it but it's tough sledding the movie.com. Yes. And uh, uh, hopefully enough information on there. Uh, if anybody wants to be an investor, they can always get hold of us or audition. We were doing some virtual auditions. Uh, you know, we're, just to, you know, while everybody's sitting around, you know, right. yeah. I throw in a tape and uh, you never know, you know, what's the casting. Once we get to the casting part of this. Yeah. You know. Well, let, let me know when you get to the casting part. I'm, I'm a really good reporter, Nifty. I'm not in charge, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Honestly, I'll, I'll remind you. I'll remind you. I'll remind you. All right. <laughs> Tell us about being the president of the Bruins Alumni Association. Like, paint the picture for us. Like, who's in the room? What are you guys doing? What are you talking about? Uh, give us a little insight into that life. Apparently, the Bruins alumni go back to about 1968. And um, where they'd play a couple games for charities, Lucy Goosey, you know. But uh, in the 80s, uh, Johnny Busick started it kind of in the form that it is today, where we would play uh, organizations, charities, and they would charge a fee. I'm not even sure what it was back in those days um, and try to keep it as low as possible, but give the guys a couple bucks for, for taking the time out of their Saturday or Sunday and travel all over New England um, to go play these games to help raise money for different causes. So uh, I started playing after my career in the 90s, probably early 90s, and then um, uh, around the 2000, uh, we decided to go to a kind of a board uh, for the for the organization, and uh, Bob Sweeney took over as president, and I was voted in as vice president. And then it was around uh, 2007 uh, they asked him to be the president of Boston Bruins Foundation, and he they wanted to wear two hats, so he went over to the foundation, and I just moved up as president of the alumni and. Uh, as I said, when I was a kid, I was kind of an organizer of, of the sled hockey or whatever, you know, baseball in the park or what. I was just an organizer. And that's basically what I do now. So I really enjoy it. We're lucky we have, a, I have about 40 guys on my list of guys that can play or would play in games. And we do upwards of 30 games a year all over New England. And we even go up into Canada in the Maritimes because they don't have their uh, they don't have their own uh, NHL team, and they get the Boston uh, TV station. So there's a ton of, of Bruins fans in the Maritimes. And uh, we've gone up there, oh, geez, every year for about 10 years. Last year was the first year we didn't. And we go other places in Canada. But the Maritimes is, is closer, about six hours drive. And we've had a lot of fun over the years. What's fun is you, you, you play – with guys you'd never played with because they're all different ages. We have guys ranging from late 30s up until, you know, myself, I'm the oldest on the team now. Terry O'Reilly just retired and I'm the oldest. And, uh, but we, we have a couple of young guys uh, and, and I'm not going to say who because they haven't played yet. They played for the Bruins and so we're hoping they're going to come up as long as they keep their homes in Boston and start playing. It really takes, uh, you know, myself and other guys about three to five years to realize, shit, nobody's going to call me. <laughs> <laughs> you, really, you really still feel you can play in the NHL. You know, you, that, okay, they, they fired me, but I could still play. And, yeah. uh, and it takes you a few, a few years to realize, ah, okay, so now, now you just do it for the camaraderie, to help raise money for a good cause, 
And then you get get to hang out with something because it's all about the dressing room. And so hang out with the guys, have a couple of beers after the game, tell stories, run this, you know. And uh, we're still doing it. We did five games this year, um, guys with masks on. Uh, and we taped them. And, and I made it a four on four so there's more room on the ice. And you can check that out on BruinsAlumni.com. Uh, we made one hour shows out of it. So um, uh, Mark Willand, who handles our website, and he did a great job. He edits them all. And uh, we got another five scheduled for uh, early 2021, January through April. And uh, hopefully next year we'll be back to the 30 game. Yeah, hopefully, right? I think yeah. uh, we want to get a full season going too. For <laughs> well, yeah, I know. I, you know, I kind of like this though, the, the shortened season, because you got to come out of the gate like a horse race. If you don't right. know the gate, you're gonna be left behind. You only got 56 games. I like that. You're like uh, they're playing two games in a row for the most part, so it's like back-to-back -back games, kind of like baseball a little bit. And uh, you know, you, you get some grudges started because the first game it carries over into the second game, uh, kind of like today with the New Jersey Devils. There's a fight in the first minute, um, so it's kind of like the old-time hockey, you know. And then. Uh, you got different divisions. You got all the Canadian divisions, you know, which which Canadians got to love because very you know that's never happened before. And uh, so a Canadian team, like somebody said to me, is going to be guaranteed to make the semifinals anyway. <laughs> so right. <laughs> it hasn't been a Canadian team in the semis that I've in a while, at least in the Stanley Cup final. Right. Well, how do you think this season's going to go in general with? you know, the different divisions and like you mentioned, the rivalries and playing, you know, the same team kind of back to back. Do you think that um, teams are going to have a harder time or are they going to be able to have a better time, especially considering maybe there could be a bubble potentially yeah. or, or anything? Well, think, well, look at what happened with Dallas. They haven't even started yet. Um, I think it's going to be a harder time. I hope that, you know, they can still play, but they're going to they have those taxi squads. You know, you, it could give a lot of uh, guys that don't get a shot a little chance to play in the NHL, which would be great. Um, so it's going to be different. Uh, in in um, past years, that when you wouldn't have that, then, you know, maybe a different team might win it. But this year, there's, there's a lot of things that could happen to really good teams and really good players. You know, unfortunately... But it could let another team in that doesn't get affected by it and, and give them a shot at. So it's just going to be interesting to see what happens and, and who really can, can can last through this horse race and get to the get to the end. So who do you think is going to make it to the end? And don't be biased towards your Bruins. <laughs> Bruins haven't scored an even even goal yet, five on five. So. They, they might have a hard time winning every game two one, but um, no, there's some powerful teams out there. I, you know, I was surprised at Dallas last year. I mean, they they really came out of nowhere. Um, you know, G Vegas always has a good team. Edmonton, you know, uh, uh, they got such powerhouse up there. Uh, you know, I think there's there's at least a half a dozen teams that could go to Tampa. You know, they always do. Uh, Montreal seems to have improved. Um, you know, Buffalo has improved, but they they, they got Washington in their first two games. You know, so um, but they could they're down two zero and two, but they could come on and win five in a row. So it's just going to be interesting to see that uh, there's a lot of strong teams out there. But like last year, I I don't think a lot of people picked Dallas to last through the West and. Uh, and I think uh, this year there, there may be a team that nobody's thinking about right now that, that may just do that. And I couldn't tell you who that is right now, honestly. I agree. Yeah. That was my, yeah. I had, I was on another podcast as a guest and they were like, who do you think is going to win the cup? I'm like, I honestly cannot give you an, an answer because this is just, this season is going to be so different. Like you were saying with, there's COVID, there's going to be players who are going to be out. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. This is a new schedule with the, with the way the game, the schedule is structured. You like you were talking. Injury, you don't have that much time to recover. I mean, you, you, right. you miss eight games. I mean, that's, 
Because that one one sixth of the season, you know, it's not right. one tenth. So, yeah, it's a know. different game for them it's now. Tough having the shortened season they can't rest on their laurels like they've got to figure out that team chemistry right away or else it's not going to happen yeah exactly and uh, like i said I, I really think the teams are really get out of the box fast you know washington looks like they've done it um i haven't Damn. even looked at the state so i don't even know who's the one about it but, you know you can have a, a sneaky team like a florida you know i thought florida would be a lot better last year and they really didn't do it maybe this is their year yeah, you know, uh, Nashville has, was great a couple of years ago, and they're, they're still good, but they, you know, they hadn't put it together the last couple of years. Maybe this is the year. Yeah, you know? and Minnesota, you know, there's so many teams. Yeah, you know, you, you don't know, and I it's so hard to follow all the players. You don't know which ones have improved. And New Jersey looks better, but you know. Uh, how are they going to be in the long run? Rangers got pounded four and a half in the other night. You know, are they going to be able to come back? So it's going to be interesting. You got to you at least win ten games to kind of get out of the weeds here and, and see who's who. So, yep, yeah. I I agree. Well, before we get to our final three questions, I wanted to ask you if you had a like a really good story or a funny story from either your time playing or coaching the, the sled hockey team, just like a funny, good moment or, or something ridiculous that happened. I mean, I know there's a lot of ridiculous stories, but you know. It's a story that most women love, all right? Because yes. it involves childbirth. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was in, uh, we were in Atlanta playing the old Atlanta Flames and it was 1980. And uh, Peter McNabb, Mike Milbury, and myself happened to go out for a couple of cold ones the night before the game. And Peter had just had a, uh, him and his wife had just had a baby girl. So he was, and my wife at the time was very pregnant. And uh, so he was the expert on childbirth at the table. <laughs> so there was before a cell phone. So I must have went uh, to, he, he called his wife, and I went and must have called my wife on, on the, uh, the pay phone. I come back and he goes, uh, how's she doing? I said, oh, her contractions are like five minutes apart. So I didn't know what that meant. He goes, she's going to have the baby. I go, get out of here. Oh, yeah, she's five minutes apart. She's going to have the baby. You got to go home. Well, you didn't let you go home in those days. It's 11 o'clock at night in Atlanta. And I'm like, What? <laughs> He goes, you got to go home. You're going to miss the birth of your first child. So we had had enough beer that he convinced me. And we hopped in a cab, the three of us. I drove to Atlanta. We drove to Atlanta Airport. I must have called my neighbor. And, but we had to stop at the liquor store to celebrate on the way to the airport. So we bought two bottles of champagne. I remember looking over at the cab driver. And cab driver. <laughs> <laughs> All I took on the plane was the other bottle of champagne. No bag. Yeah. So I landed at about 4.30 in the morning and my neighbor picked me up. I get home and, and she's still five minutes apart. So I go, oh. so we might as well go into the hospital. No use going to bed. Just let's go in. So we go into the hospital. All morning she's in labor. Right? I call back because I'm not at the morning skate now. So they're like, where's Middleton, right? So I had called Peter. I said, what what they say? They said, just get your ass back here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so the doctor, my memory of it is the doctor came out about noon. Now she's been in labor all morning and, and he goes, you know, she's really tired. He says, I could induce her. I said, well, that'd be good because I got to get to Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> so he induced my wife. My daughter was born. We were like, Look, okay, see you later. Off in a cab to Logan Airport. <laughs> we always get flights to Atlanta. I got hopped on a flight, landed in, in, in Atlanta, and uh, grab a cab to the Omni, it was called in those days. And I'm looking at my watch, and I'm like, I can really warm up. And I'm, thinking, I'm running into the thing. Now, I haven't slept in like 36 hours, right? And the first guy I see is Harry Sinden, and he's giving me this, calling me over. I'm thinking, oh, no. Yeah. I, I, I did all this. Like, I'm running back here, and I'm thinking, he's going to find me or maybe not even dress me I'm thinking right it calls me over and goes I just fired Fred Creighton I'm going behind the bench tonight I went great Harry <laughs> <laughs> Fred Creighton was the coach that 
followed Don Cherry. They hired after Don Cherry. He didn't even make it the year. He got fired on March 22nd, 1980, the day when my daughter was born. And we went out. I scored a goal in the first period, and we won 4-1. And I kept a puck in a drawer for all those years, and I gave it to my daughter on her 30th birthday. There's a, a little trophy with the A on it, the old, the old Atlanta A. Oh. Yeah. Well, everybody loves that story. But uh, I, I, I laugh today. They go, oh, they're going to play three games. And play three games. You know, they play. <laughs> we used to fly commercial. And uh, anyway. Oh, yeah. But, that's a good story. I like that story. It, it, it was, and that's the way I remember it. I think it happened. We'll have to converse with your wife or your. <laughs> what happened today? It could never happen today. <laughs> no way. Yeah. You can't even bring a bottle of champagne on the plane. No, no. I love no, it. No. But, and then just funny. go to the airport and hop on, you know, like it was right? the uh, shuttle to New York. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah. Everybody likes that story. That's one of the ones you can tell. <laughs> exactly. That was a great one. I think that might have been one of the uh, best ones yet. <laughs> oh, good. Good. yeah that so uh that's even better right mm -hmm. so at the end of every episode we ask our uh final three questions and uh it doesn't matter who the person is you're still going to get asked these three questions so we'll, okay. uh we'll stop we'll top it off so who is your favorite could be anyone current or or past uh your favorite hockey hunk hockey what hunk Hockey hunk. Yep. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Hockey hunk. There was a lot of ugly guys when I played. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the guy that got all the notoriety for going out with beautiful women and everything was Ron Doogie in, uh, in New York. Doogie. All right. As, as they call him, Doogie. I didn't play with Doogie. He came the year after I got traded, but we've played a lot of charity games and such together. And who's your favorite hockey lady? Hockey lady. That's also a very good one. Um, I got to know uh, quite a few of the, the U.S. girls national team that won. They were the first ones to beat Canada uh, for gold. 98, maybe. I, I, can, I honestly can't remember the year, but uh, and and I got to know her very well. And she's a very, very great girl. Her name's Shelly Looney. And she scored the winning goal against Canada uh, in, in the Olympics to win the first gold medal for, for a U.S. women. Because it's always U.S. Canada in the, in the women's hockey. So. Right. And, and Canada always had the, their way with them, you know, always beat them, even though it was always close. And they finally did it. And uh, I just don't remember the year, but Shelly Rooney. Yep. That's awesome. And then our final question is, do you have a Sidney Crosby story? Well, he's so much younger than me. I've never even met Sidney. There but, we go. <laughs> uh, I just know he comes from Nova Scotia, in the same town that Brad Marchand is from, I believe. And their hockey and, and Nathan McKinnon. I mean, there must yep. be something in the water up there. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> really, right outside of Halifax. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they know how to grow their hockey players up there. But no, he uh, he always impressed me because he's he's uh, he's a good leader. He, he's always uh, he, he keeps his head about him, and he's and he leads on the ice. I mean, he's he's a great player. Not just because he scores a lot of goals. But he, uh, he does it at the right times and he's, he's helped them win some, some cups. So uh, I always like to, to me. I like to uh, meet him one day. Put it that way. Always the same questions. You don't miss them up. Are they, yeah. Nope. Always the same. It's our, uh, I guess you can say it's our iconic close off, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Tell us the name of the website again for the movie and the Bruins alumni where they can watch the games um, so people can uh, keep up with you. Sure. The movie is. Tough sledding at themove.com and for the Bruins alumni it's just Boston Bruins and we have a, what we call alumni TV now and uh, we just got it off the ground uh, this year funny how you know in a pandemic you know some sometimes new things come up and we uh, I decided looking at the NHL and the bubble that we'd only play out of one rink this year to keep it safe 
Mm-hmm. And that's how it all happened. And we ended up taking the games. And so good awesome. things sometimes happen in, in tragedy. So. Thanks for coming over to our House of Hockey podcast and hanging out with us. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And in the meantime, you can follow us on social media. Just look for House of Hockey podcast. We'll be back next week.